Some believe that the powerful psychedelic drug, lysergic acid diethylamide can momentarily take over a person's mind. The effects can be extreme, but they believe in its capacity to unlock the powers of the mind, for the ultimate goal of illuminating life's hidden realities. 1960s American psychologist and prominent psychedelic drug advocate, Dr. Timothy Leary said, a poor experience, or a bad trip, can be avoided by mentally preparing, but physical location of the experience is also paramount. To put it another way, LSD should not be taken lightly. The history of LSD in America has a very interesting chapter. In the 1950s and 1960s, the CIA gave LSD to a number of unwitting Americans. College students, drug addicts, veterans, soldiers, psychiatric patients, parents, clients of prostitutes, and a jazz singer were all subjected to covert trials. At one point, the drug was so common in the CIA that agents would give each other doses just for fun. Amazingly, the CIA's acid testing foreshadowed and effectively created the heyday of 1960s counterculture, including its defiance of the establishment. I give the CIA a total credit for sponsoring and initiating the entire consciousness movement, counterculture events of the 1960s. In 1951, the CIA received news from a military official that Sandoz Pharmaceuticals, a Swiss drug manufacturer, had 100 million doses of LSD ready for purchase by anyone that wanted it. This included archenemy, the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, who were viewed as crooked, powerful, and unscrupulous by the US military and intelligence communities. They believed that a water supply poisoned with LSD could be used by the Soviet Union to cause entire American cities to rebel against the US government. The CIA was aware that the Russians were conducting experiments to discover ways to undermine ordinary people's behavior and personalities. They sought to develop a truth serum and figure out how to turn ordinary people into unaware and involuntary assassins. The American government, as it turned out, was equally curious. When the Sandoz supply was discovered, the U.S. acted to remove it from the open market. An American officer who got milligrams and kilograms mixed up. In other words, he made a mistake of thinking one one thousandth of a gram was the same as one thousand grams, which is a mistake of a million times. So when the CIA got the intelligence that there were a hundred million doses on the market, in fact there were a hundred doses. Regardless, the U.S. purchased them all. Military researchers and the CIA began conducting their own trials with LSD at that point. The clandestine operation was called MKUltra. This was the codename for an overall operation spanning over 149 subprojects. All of which incidentally, were investigated by Congress in 1975. The majority of the projects were working on developing new techniques for chemical and psychological warfare. It's now two and a half hours since you took the LSD. Does that seem right to you? Yes, it's about right. A Senate committee called the Church Committee conducted the investigation, but learned very little about the operations. The CIA maintained its usual secrecy, claiming that all the papers had been destroyed and that the new directors were unaware of previous initiatives. MK Ultra's secrets were discovered two years later. A journalist's Freedom of Information Act request turned up numerous boxes of documentation that had survived destruction, but had been missing throughout the church investigation. MK Ultra was the subject of a second congressional investigation in 1977. We are not professing to tell you the complete story of these activities. Yeah. We are professing to tell you the complete story that we know. Right. But these records that we've uncovered yeah. don't tell the story, they tell pieces of it. 149 subprojects were discovered ranging from learning to administer poisons via magician's sleight of hand, to utilizing electroshock therapy, to force an unwilling victim to speak. Dates, locations, and names of unwitting participants in the CIA's tests were revealed. Some of the personnel who carried out the trials were also identified. At the time the CIA's technical branch was run by Dr. Sidney Gottlieb. A former army officer by the name of George Hunter White, who is said to have slain a Chinese spy, 
with only his hands, handled the undercover acid tests for Gottlieb. Much of the foundational work was done under White's instruction by Eck Feldman, a narcotics agent who would pose as a pimp and racketeer. These three men, together, filled out every inch of the CIA's murky public image. At CIA labs, independent research centers, and universities, the majority of the MK Ultra studies were carried out using the scientific method. With informed and willing test subjects. The scientific method is an empirical method of acquiring knowledge involving careful observation and applying rigorous skepticism about what is observed. Because cognitive preconceptions can affect how one understands what they are observing. Some of the tests, though, did not follow official protocol. For example, one study enticed heroin addicts to serve as test subjects by offering them cash in exchange for their participation. Another looked into the impact of LSD on African-American prison inmates. The studies carried out at Gottlieb's request by White and Feldman were less scientific. Sometimes the tests would look like a wild party. But often they actually resembled torture. By the time he was hired to carry out Dr. Gottlieb's experiments, George Hunter White was already something of a legend in the law enforcement community. So the waiter says, you may help you, monsieur. And George Wright was busy talking with me. I paid no attention to the waiter, so the waiter tapped him on the shoulder, says, you may help you, uh, monsieur. George Wright turned around, whipped his gun out, and stuck it in the guy's face like this in this crowded restaurant. He'd established a reputation for himself by operating undercover as a heroin trafficker and busting a Chinese opium trafficking ring. However, after digging up political dirt on the governor, White was essentially kicked out of New York. White was described as impulsive, irresponsible, and the best guy for the job when it required callousness and a complete disdain for established laws and social standards. Gottlieb's tests were initially carried out by White. White and his wife hosted parties in their New York apartment. They served LSD-laced martinis to their guests. He studied the drug's impact on the unwitting participants as it took hold, taking notes on their reactions. The results ranged from giddiness to ecstasy in some cases, to the participants realizing something was seriously wrong and responding angrily in others. This type of reaction was dubbed by White, the horrors. The tests were eventually relocated from White's New York apartment to a location called The Pad which was a CIA-funded safe house in San Francisco. Ike Feldman was recruited by White at the pad. Feldman would pretend to be a pimp, collecting prostitutes and paying them to bring customers back to the pad, where he'd secretly add LSD to their drinks. All the while, George White sat behind a two-way mirror, sipping martinis and observing the unwitting participants' reactions. White continued his direct engagement in the MK Ultra LSD tests in San Francisco, as he had done in New York. Only now, he'd take on the persona of an artist or a merchant sailor. More often than not, he was also high on acid. He'd delve into San Francisco's seedy underbelly of hookers, drug addicts, and sexual deviants. The CIA had determined that this community was fair game for the testing, since they were looked at as degenerates. White used his undercover personalities to find test subjects. It's now agreed that the MK Ultra researchers failed to maintain an acceptable and neutral distance from their experiments. However, at the time, the CIA decided that their operatives should experience the effects of LSD for themselves in order to prepare them in case they were handed the drug by Soviet agents. They believed that they'd be more prepared to deal with the distorted perception of events brought on by a dose of the drug. It's uncertain if this official decision started or justified an acid-using culture in the CIA in the 1950s. In any case, a considerable number of CIA officers knew what it was like to trip on acid. The unscientific research was generally problematic, and at least one individual is believed to have died as a result of covert dosing. In the 1950s, a CIA officer knew not to accept a drink from another CIA operative unless he had a spare 12 hours to go on a trip. 
It was reported that one army scientist received an acid-laced drink from an agent during a joint Army-CIA meeting. Frank Olson was a chemist for the Army Chemical Corps. At some point during the meeting, he was unknowingly dosed with LSD. And in what could only be described as a worst-case scenario, he had an absolutely horrific reaction to the drug. Long after the LSD's effects should have worn off, he developed intense paranoia. He even skipped Thanksgiving dinner with his family because he was afraid of seeing them. Horrifically, Olson passed away eight days later. He'd supposedly committed suicide by jumping from a New York hotel's 10th floor window. Curiously though, evidence emerged in the 1990s suggesting the possibility that he was hit on the head with a blunt instrument before falling out of the window. Another disturbing incident occurred at the Allen Memorial Institute of Psychiatry in Montreal, Canada. The CIA funded McGill University's Dr. Ewan Cameron to oversee the project. The experiments were deeply disturbing. And much of the focus seemed to have been on the subject of brainwashing. Dr. Cameron was interested in three main areas. He called them sleep therapy, psychic driving, and depatterning. Dr. Cameron's colleague, Dr. Maurice Dangier, described the troubling experiments. In his uh, psychic driving, uh, so-called uh, type of, of therapy, he would give the patient intensive uh, electric treatment in order to make the patient uh, regress deeply, uh, become forgetful, and then he would uh, attempt to implant new ideas uh, in uh, the mind of the patient. This was an obvious attempt to use the effects of LSD to brainwash. A woman from Winnipeg, named Val Orlico, was a patient at the institute. She was being treated for depression and she unknowingly became one of Dr. Cameron's LSD test subjects. She described the horrendous experience. Nobody explained it to me, nobody ever asked me if I was willing to do it or anything. And then the drug began to take hold very rapidly because it was an IV injection and um, things became very furry and uh, very frightening and uh, had a lot of sensations that it's very difficult to recall. Dr. Cameron continued to what he viewed as the next step in the brainwashing process. He called it psychic driving. It involved playing tapes of recorded messages and administering more LSD. He believed this was a way to make direct changes to someone's personality. But for Val Orlico, the experiment made her severe depression dangerous. And I became more and more despondent and more and more angry. I just became so despondent that I thought I can't, I can't live like this any longer. And I thought I would just go out and throw myself underneath the cars on McGregor. Then Dr. Cameron moved on to the third step, which he called depatterning. He believed he could break the existing patterns of behavior by administering extreme shock therapy, followed by long periods of sleep. He would treat patients with the combination of electric shock therapy and sleep for up to 30 days. But in one instance, he kept a patient asleep for 65 days. When Dr. Cameron retired, his successor, Dr. Robert Cleghorn ordered Cameron's CIA experiments to be reviewed. It showed that it was no more beneficial in its result than the use of more conservative methods. That makes me angry and sad and I don't know what, how to explain how I feel, really. I just, I just... I realize the CIA is a very important organization and they have a very important job to do. But God, it surely doesn't have to be done on people who are totally incapable of knowing what's happening or having any defense against it. And I, I, I can't imagine the mentality of people who would do this. I just can't. MK Ultra was disbanded in the early 1970s. When it was made public, it validated many conspiracy theories and suspicions about what the U.S. government can do when it feels threatened. The culprits somehow escaped punishment. 
In 1965, George White retired and was known to harass his neighbors by driving his Jeep through their front yards. Dr. Gottlieb retired and volunteered to assist with AIDS in cancer patients. Like many events of the Cold War, MKUltra was an attempt to beat the Soviets at their own game. The effects of LSD were generally unknown or misunderstood. The American military and intelligence agencies thought it could be used as a tool or a weapon. The goal was to understand what it did. Could it really be considered a truth serum? Could a person be controlled and used covertly to retrieve information or even commit violence? Ultimately, the project was shut down for a myriad of reasons. It was not a truth serum or a way to control minds. Worst of all many people were abused and some even died as a result of the largely unregulated testing. So what do you think? Did MK Ultra really get shut down in the 70s? Do you think the men in charge should have been charged with crimes? Let us know in the comments.